I saw a really interesting video uh, and I need to watch sit down and watch the whole thing. But and I think it's probably not 100 percent accurate, but there's the title of the episode is there is no culture war. Mm-hmm. He's basically saying, like, there is no culture war. Like, mm-hmm. it, this is all being set up so everyone is getting irate and everyone is getting mm-hmm. mad. It's like, it is all purposeful. Everything is very, very, like... Yeah, the, he- the Hegelian dialectic, right? That's exactly. Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host Andrew, and I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, what is uh, okay? All right, what was the worst? What was the most disappointing live act you guys have ever seen? Haven't we done this one? (laughs) Have we done this? No, I think you asked what was the worst, but I think most disappointing is a different question. Most disappointing is a different Okay, I haven't because... I had like three questions in my head. So let, let's do another one. If we've done okay. this one, then we'll do another one. Well, I mean, the, it is a different question, right? Okay, like sure. Wor- Cuz worst, I wasn't I the my worst was not my most disappointing for sure because I didn't go in with high expectations. We really did this one already? Have we done this many episodes where I'm not remembering the questions? Well, I've here's yeah. the thing. We've never done this before where there's been like, have I done this question? So that right. in itself is a novelty. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. We could do most disappointing. Okay, sure. We could do most disappointing. Mine was, I'll, I'll just go first. Mine was, there was this band I was into for a while. I, I'm kind of still into them. I like them. Okay, they're a Christian metal bo- uh, metalcore band called The Chariot. And one year at Cornerstone, which was a Christian music festival. Yeah, yeah, I know. They're not great now. But when I listen to them, it engenders nostalgia. I, I like their very, very first album. Um, not the EP, but the first uh, Everything is Alive, whatever, that album. Um, uh, but uh, there was one year at Cornerstone. I want to say it was like 2006 or 2007 or something like that. And it was the chariot, and then it was a bunch of other Christian metalcore bands all on the main stage at Cornerstone. Mm-hmm. And they opened up, and I don't know what it was that was just a whack show. It just was like they didn't never really seem to get together. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon because it was like an all night thing. And they were at this really weird time in their career, I guess, where they had like abandoned the sound of their first album, but they hadn't found like their new sound yet. And they just released this incredibly unpopular EP. And it was just like, I just remember walking and just being like really disappointed. Cause I was like pretty excited to see them. Cause I saw them a couple of years before and they were insane live. Like it was at night, it was a smaller stage and, um, and uh, they were going all over the place. They were just rocking out crazy. And then I went and saw that one. And then Norma Jean came on next and they were awesome. But that Chariot show, I was really looking forward to that. I was pretty heavy into them right then. So that's that. You want to go, well, Father? Well, um, I started saying me without you, but. Uh, uh, this guy. <laughs> this um, guy. Actually, the most disappointing show I think I've ever seen was, um, I think it was my, it was like Bad Brain's first mm. tour back. Uh, and I was really excited to see them. And had you seen them before? Yeah. And I, ooh, it was, is at the House of Blues, and it was, you know, I remember um, telling this guy uh, when we were walking out. I, I mean, the highlight of that show was taking my old my oldest son with me. He was like, mm-hmm. he's like nine or ten or something, maybe eleven. That was like the highlight was taking Levi with me. But it was just kind of like, oh man, and everyone was just like, come on, because like, HR just stood there and just kind of like, oh, was he pouting? 
uh, it was like a mix of pouting, mix of just like, I'm out of my mind, but he literally just like mm. stood there, you know, not quite Sid Barrett status stood there, but just kind of stood there and people were like, ah, oh. and at the time I was just like, look guys, I mean, they, if anyone gets to like get a break, it's, it's HR. Cause I mean, he's just, he's one of the most nuttiest madmen ever, you know? So I'm like, he's old and whatever, but I got to admit that was super disappointing. It was just like, yeah. Anyways. Mm. They have some infamous show in, uh, I think, Lawrence. I think I've heard a couple of Kansas. Older... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, a, a couple older older dudes, older punk dudes have talked about this show where he just sat there like on the mm -hmm. drum set the entire time while the band was like playing and he just wouldn't sing or something like mm -hmm. that. And I don't know. It's I don't, kind I don't of know much about for that it. stuff. So whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I guess when you're him, you can do whatever you want because. Or you think you, know. you can. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. That's that's the problem. Yeah. What about you, Cyprian? The Certainly not Celine Dion because that, you tell me that was no, a good. No, that was rocking. I that's thought so. That's what I thought. I mean, incredible. Yeah. No, but it was at the exact same. It well the same. Let's not the same venue, mm -hmm. but within a few steps of that venue, because it was at Caesar's Palace and it was in 2011, right with the debut, I believe, of like his second, I don't know what you call it, album, I guess, that came out the weekend. And it was at oh. Pure Nightclub. It was one of the last shows they had there before it was shut down. Everybody was super. He was still kind of underground. But like those in the know definitely knew. And I was super excited because we were filming the show that I was on at this. I think we were filming the second season at the same time. So it was like a group of like the crew, the producers, some of the people who were on the show, people associated with the show. We got it all together, like got a, a amazing table at like pure nightclub right everybody was like talking about it for the, for that week that was the whole thing oh the weekend it's gonna be awesome we got there we're looking around like where's he gonna perform because they didn't even set up a stage where this where they would do the stage they just put extra tables and then it's just like the night's going on it's going on and i don't know it was probably like about 12 30 or one the place is completely packed they bring him out like no band no no it's just him. they just give him a wireless microphone he does like one and a half songs and dips and just takes off wow and tables were like ten thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars oh yeah wow. yeah 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 absolutely oh. absolutely it was like a friday night oh, and i was just like yo yeah. Yo. Yeah. Did it's you funny because like i don't really know much about him i'm just uh, you know he's ethiopian orthodox yeah, he is. Well, he's Ethiopian for sure. Well, isn't he like crazy Satan guy now? Yes, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. But yeah, his his family. He was raised Ethiopian Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I looked at, I was like, "What religion is the weekend?" And the answer is Ethiopian Orthodox. Yeah, yeah. Now it's like Satan. <laughs> yeah, I know for real. <laughs> it should have that crossed out when it's like Satan scribbled yeah, in. Satan. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was really like that was bunk. Well, I I mean it's this thing about the difference between a the difference between a musician and a recording artist. Like there's a difference between those two things. Mm -hmm. You know what I no, mean? Like the music doubt. industry and the recording industry are mm -hmm. two different industries. One of my favorite things I love looking at, I don't know why I always look at those lists on YouTube or whatever, it's like top mm. 10 worst live bands, like mm -hmm. bands that you just always, and there's always like the reoccurring ones, which Guns N' Roses, uh, mm -hmm. Deftones, for some reason, I don't know, I guess Deftones mm. is just awful mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 Seconds to Mars is a shocker to nobody because I just do oh, not. of course. Think, yeah, of they're course. just awful in the first place. There's a couple other ones that it's like, I wasn't surprised, but I was surprised, but I love looking at those lists. But. Well, that's the 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 you know the cool thing about Vegas is that um, you know it really is a place for musicians. Like, because there's so much live music in that town. Sure. Everywhere you go, 
there's live music. And very often I would wind up in some location. Maybe it's just in a casino, like on an off night. And they all have stages all over the place. And it would be like a cover band, right? But that would just be absolutely nailing it. Yeah. And everybody from the casino would just be there dancing, doing the whole thing. And you're just like, yo, these guys are incredible. Yeah. Because it's it would just be like from all over the world. Because, dude, you've got a, a you've got a gig in Vegas, or most of these bands will play in multiple places in town, right? And they'll it'll just be like they're they're professional musicians. They just play every night. Have they ever recorded anything? No. But you're like, yo, every single one of these people in this band is incredible. And then you go and you find out that they're all like that they've all played with like gigantic bands. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like and that they're all, that they're all like the, the most legit musicians that you could imagine. And it's like, that's the music industry. Yeah. But where is that anymore? Like, where could you even go and hear like l live music? It's just dying. Well, it just feels like live music, like everything else is just slowly being replaced by something faux. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like something I mean, uh, Surprise, surprise, anti. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know. But don't you know. think about how long live music as a like a profession. And of course, the recording industry destroyed that. Because before the recording industry, you can get rich as a musician. Like as a professional musician, you weren't going to you were never going to be rich. Yeah. But even like, I, I think the biggest thing for, and from my perspective, it's. This whole idea of music performing music as culture way of life mm -hmm. you know what i mean um not just as like passive entertainment mm -hmm. but something that helped communicate life to us i think that's one of the things that's um we are we haven't we're not even aware of it's gone and missing mm. because something else slid in there um but i think it's changed us in a certain way, you know what I mean? Because, you know, the, the on wonder behind creating music is like uh, today, you know, like I can't remember what I was doing today, but um, at some point in time, I, I was listening to, I was listening to some chant, some chant or whatever. And it's just like one of those moments where I was like, man, the human is the greatest, like the human person, the, greatest human instrument. Was, the, the greatest instrument, you know what I mean? Yeah, by far, by far. Just ask and, Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> and like we're, <laughs> so yeah, I think the fact that we're losing that, and it might be one of the things that people don't realize, but I think it's something about orthodoxy that is really mm. speaking to people, you know, because it's all, I think for a lot of people, they'll have like their top 20, and I don't know if that would even come on their list yet. You know what I mean? Um, they may say the music, but I don't think what they mean is the actual like creation of the music. I think they mean um, their kind of awareness of the exoticness of the music or like how it makes me feel, which is awesome. I don't think they'll, I don't think most people are thinking about the fact that humans are. <laughs> you know what i mean this music is coming forth from humans and the um well and what about the participatory nature of it like well, i feel like a lot of people are, are, have no agency right because like mm -hmm. there there was a time i think especially among among certain among but it, it the reason why it's among certain classes was because of the value of it that it's like you know, in order for you to be considered of a certain social status, you better be able to play an instrument mm -hmm. or sing mm -hmm. really well, mm -hmm. right? Like if you can't do those things, you're not of well, a, you're not of a certain class. Well, it's, I mean, the thing is, is like literacy. It's a type of literacy. Literacy, right? exactly. And, oh, and that's so, yes. It's and literacy. So, yeah, and so like even now, I mean, I can't remember. I don't know. Everything's a blur. Lens getting crazy, but. Some point in time, it was like I was, something hit me about like literacy rates being, mm. you know, just abysmal right now. Mm. And it was connected, obviously, to the advent of like digital media and all those things. But it isn't just about attention span going to pot. I think it's about actually the medium as well. And so this this literacy being, you know, re like the literacy of of you know, the kind of what the quality of, of, of humanity, 
mm. like what it is that defines humanity and, and the richness that we're to experience. Um, and so the absence of literacy of music, of art, like think about, you know, even not that long ago, um, art drafting, quote unquote, was a literacy that, you know, was a sign of like culture and things like that, um, which is interesting because getting back to our quote earlier about, you know, St. Nikolai and his, uh, or St. Nikolai's quote about culture. Yeah, you know, we have to be careful here to not just kind of associate too much um, definition of, hum of, you know, ontology of what it means to be human with like exclusively like a cultural marker. But I think pulling, pulling back, I think in every society and culture, there is these aspects that are universal in regards of being able to tell story whether it's the the gear the griot in like africa or if it's like you know wherever it is there's this aspect of being able to tell story to the bard the bard, the bard in europe yeah you know what i mean it's like it's 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 an it's a skill and it's a it's a it's literacy that is lost and the tragedy perhaps is that people don't realize it's lost because it's been replaced by a very plastic uh, an anti and so it's an it's an it's been replaced by something, um, you know, what, what would you call it? An anti, <laughs> an, an an anti life, you know. Well, it's mm -hmm. it's the because what what happens is that the value what used to be in part of the value of the storytelling was could you retain the story, mm -hmm. right? And which means could you embody the story? I mean, speaking of which, speaking of which, there's um. Oh goodness! I'm, it was I'm pretty sure it was I'm pretty sure it's Pajot, mm. and it might have been with um, with Richard Roland, I think. But you know they're doing that kind of like historical series, which is great. Mm -hmm. But there's the one they did on Ethiopia. Kind yeah. Of the, yep. 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 I watched that. That one's incredible because, especially like you know, I mean, I know about the Ethiopian culture. Speaking of the weekend and all that stuff, mm -hmm. probably obviously more than the average guy on the street without being Ethiopian Orthodox, or whatever. But there's some stuff that I didn't even know about, like you're talking about, like in their tradition, and like they didn't have like seminary per se, but these, you know, those who become presbyters and those who serve the church, like they have these huge long poems that they would have to memorize, and they would know. I was it's. And that's indicative of, of like true high culture, like on a kind of more human level. You know what I mean? Like on, on a more universal level. And I, it's it's that exact thing, the capacity for memory and the capacity for memory equating the capacity to um, embody. You know what I mean? And that's, mm -hmm. I, I caught that as well. I caught that as well. No, oh, that's, I mean, that's, it's interesting because that, I mean, it's whatever but there's a new like i see it a lot with like maybe people maybe it's just the population i work with so like maybe a little bit more homeless folk but there are people who do not know how to use computers mm -hmm. but they know how to use a phone you know and like that's interesting because that even takes like the little bit of like oh you mean like a smartphone mm -hmm. sorry yes yeah, like a smartphone okay. yeah. yeah so they don't know how to boot up an internet browser like the end once they're there, like they don't even really know how to like URL anything, like type anything into mm. URL bar because most of the time it's just voice to text in the Google search bar or whatever. They're using voice. Yeah. So it's like this whole like, okay, well, even if there was like digital literacy regarding like. Well, and there is. Kind of and there is, by the way. Well, as sure. A, as yeah. a software developer, I can tell you like there is a broad spectrum from like, because my four year old can navigate with her voice on a tablet. Sure. She's she's she she can't read, but she can absolutely navigate with her voice on a tablet. No problem. She yeah. Yeah, and but like even people entering reentering society from corrections or whatever, mm -hmm. they'll come I mean, I I think I talked about it on the podcast but like 10 years ago there's like a post or something. It was like 10 years ago these companies didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it was like it was like a lot of them, it was like Uber. I mean, it was like it was like Uber it I can't, I, it, TikTok, you Dude, know, Airbnb, like, Airbnb, you yeah. know, all these, yeah. this new stuff or whatever. And it's like, so imagine you've been in jail for the last 10 years, you've been in prison for the last 10 years and you come out, you have no digital literacy. 
you have no ability to like interact with the box. Like there's, there's no way, there's nothing you can do. You might as well be sitting down in front of like, you know, a, a cardboard shoe or something. I don't know. So like this whole, like last little facet of being able to like, I actually sit down and interact with the thing in a way that's like maybe even meaningful in a way, you know, like you actually have to do the typing, you have to interact it to do the searching. It's all just like fed to you and stuff. But anyway, that's like half a thought. But anyway, I want to. Well, you become in that case, you become passive. Mm-hmm. It's you're extremely not, there's, passive. There's no there's no there's no agency. You're not a part of the world. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to dictate to you. And you what, said something what truth is. You said something to me that was actually very interesting. I never thought of, but like, mm. cause I, I've never been on TikTok, mm. but you don't get to pick what videos you watch. It just no. gives you videos. I mean, yeah. you can, you can say, okay, I want to know more about dog hairstyles or something like that. Cause that's imagine what people look at on TikTok and stuff, mm-hmm. but it's like, I want to look at that more, but it's not like you get to go through and like, there's like a selection of videos and you go and pick that one. It's like, no, you scroll. No. You see the setup, you see what's happening, and you're like, I'm not interested, or I am interested. And I'm sure it's like measuring all your like your pupils dilating mm-hmm. and how fast your pulse is going to see, like, okay, what better way can we entertain this person or whatever? But that's but, how people want to consume it, right? Because it's not just TikTok, but like every platform is moving in that direction. I mean, well, like YouTube shorts, isn't like that it. how they kind of that's work? That's exactly too, that's exactly how it works. Like they're all moving in that direction mm-hmm. because that's actually the de- the desire of people because the algorithm is getting so much better that they're outsourcing now their taste, right? Which is very dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like if you outsource your taste to an algorithm, you're basically saying like, tell me what I desire. Mm-hmm. And then we get into the Rene Girard situation where you're like, oh, you're in a real mm-hmm. bad place right there. Like yeah. you're a slave at that point. The algorithm in a, in a way that you don't understand, you're a slave. The algorithm does not get me. I can tell you that much. The videos it recommends to me, I have absolutely I have little to no interest in. And like I'm off, I'm off all of it now. Like I deleted my YouTube app on my phone and stuff because it was a gigantic time waster. And um I because the YouTube shorts are killing me. But um I would I, it could not figure me out. It could not get a, a read on me because it would be like, you want to watch Grand Theft Auto videos? And I'm like, I mean, I guess, but not really. Is that okay? Well, do you want to check out these videos about the new Halo game? I'm like, again, sure, but not, I'm not like into this. This is not like what I'm really, I tell you what I could get lost in is comic artist drawing. I could get lost in that, but I oh, it would have found that eventually. If you would have stayed at it, it would have found it. Well, I said that one time to your brother in the church. I was like, Amazon is still like suggesting like beard trimming clips or like like beard trimming sets and like yeah. car wax and stuff. And I'm like, you do not get me, Amazon. Like you just don't get me. These are things I do not care about. And he, he said, well, do you have any other social media? I was like, no. He's like, that's why. You don't that's have any why. other social media. That's why they can't get a read on you. It's so, blinded by that. Yeah. It's, Ghost all, protocol. it's all tied together. It's all tied together. Yeah, ghost protocol. That's yeah. that's me. I'm, but I'm... it's tied together in a weird way, and I think that this is like a a, a real powers and principalities thing. Oh, is yeah. that it's it's tied actually? People would think, oh, it's tied together because all of these systems are talking to each other, but that's not actually true. Oh, each one of the systems is siloed. It's tied together because of our own behavior. So what it's reading is like you go on YouTube, you start watching things. And then you go on Amazon and you search something that comes from the thing that you watched and it starts to actually understand the pattern of you. So it's reading you, it's reading the man, it's not reading the cards. It's reading you. And so the YouTube algorithm starts controlling you, then the Amazon one is in a feedback loop and then you start watching the things on YouTube and it goes, and eventually they get all sort of congealed between one another. And then the Facebook so, one is tracking you on the web as you do. It's really. So if you start watching like s- clips from the Sopranos on YouTube shorts or something like that, you can get on Amazon and say, hey, by the way, we have all of this for sale, you know, for like 80 bucks or whatever like that. And I, I don't know. It's just, I'm in ghost protocol. Cyprian, all this is going above my head. I'm not, I'm not getting any of this, bro. Dude, it's, that's good. It's read on me. That's good. That's good. Well, it's interesting, too, because, I mean, there's a lot of us who, on the one hand, are longing for 
some kind of cataclysmic event where you know like it's all you know like EMP it's all done away with whatever but at the same time it's kind of like the addict who's just like wanting to be mm. caught you know what I mean the For addict sure. who's like wanting to have that kind of event happen to the to to make them hit rock bottom you know what I mean sure and, and I, I it's just it's something that it's almost a ubiquitous statement that everyone feels just like you said it yourself, you're not even really into it or, or on it as much, but like the shorts are killing me. Like I've heard that from, from everyone. Oh, those YouTube Dude, shorts are killing shorts, me, you know? man. And so it's interesting to me because it it you couple like it's a, like that is like a proof text statement of what you're talking about, Supreme, because it's like the vampiric nature of it. Mm-hmm. And really kind of being aware, like this is sucking something out of me. I hate it, but I can't stop it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, you know, playing on our passions, however you want to look at it. But it's mm-hmm. it's interesting because it, it's it's happening slow, you know, slow motion car wreck. And it's, we're all just kind of like waiting for. It's really, know. it's really interesting because like I'd be scrolling through and I, and it's one of the, the one of those beginning red flags that I'd be scrolling through. I get like seven or eight videos of whatever I was watching. I don't know. Um, it's not because I'm embarrassed. I genuinely, I, I really don't remember. And then suddenly like a father, Peter, hears a video would come on mm-hmm. and it's no more than 15, 20 seconds, mm-hmm. but that would feel so long to me. Like mm-hmm. it, because it would just be like, or like a quote from a saint. Cause there was this one channel that just like has the icon of the saint, a quote that mm-hmm. they said. And with like chant playing in the background or whatever, yep, I get those. Th- those, shows yeah, those are great. great. Yeah. I love yeah. them. I got yeah, a yeah. bunch of them screenshot on my phone. I love them. I whip them out every once in a while. It's like, oh, St. John Chrysostom says this or whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, suddenly I was just, ugh, it's like any kind of like effort. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, like maybe you've had like a pretty self indulgent day. Maybe this is not a universal experience, but I like you had like a pretty self indulgent day and it comes time to pray. Well, like, hold on. That's exactly what's happened. That is a universal oh, I, experience. Oh, I know. Everybody's feeling that. Because what this is, I mean, this is the demon of the noonday that's been unleashed on us. You know, one hundred percent. Because so, the first thing that comes to my brain is like, but you pray all day. You have to uh, pray some more. I'm like, I have not uh, been praying all day. Uh, I've been watching Grand Theft Auto and Halo videos, I guess, <laughs> like, and videos of like cats falling or something. I don't know. What's well, well, it's interesting because, um, and I'll, I'll just say it for the record, someone out there is going to correct, and I'll welcome the correction. Um, uh, Acadia, Acedia, somebody let me know the best way to put it, I'm sure. It's oh. But, I mean, it's the middle of Lent, right? And, like, it's a big thing that hits everyone's effort, this kind of slump. It's slop, but it, it's it's slop, but it's not sloth in the sense of like I'm just like lazy. I don't want to clean my room. It's it's a sloth. It's an indifference towards our spiritual life. It's a mm-hmm. particular thing. Mm-hmm. It's a very particular thing. And the reason it's important to understand this because when people read about it, they hear about it, they can think, oh yeah, just yeah, I get that. I just call it sloth procrastination, but it's not that because you can get an energy from it too. It's like it's time to pray it's time to you know tend to your soul oh man i gotta go scrub the mm-hmm. ground with yep. a toothbrush you know what i mean yep. and so it can take on all kinds of it's really pernicious because it can take it can come into the form of gluttony mm-hmm. it can come in the form of all kinds of it's basically distraction yeah. it's 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 a distraction that will facilitate indifference the whole mm. thing is indifference towards the our spiritual lives and it's this is really what the digital lifestyle has brought on to us. You know, it's just a kind of um, it's made it a byproduct of our culture. You know, this kind of globalist, um, disembodied, Gnostic um, experience that we're all kind of like hurled in, like like thrust into. It, it really is this like, you know, the demon of the new day is kind of like. Oh. competing now you know what i mean with the demon of lust because he's like hey you know um 
it's almost like they've got a little bargain going. You know, um, I was talking with my my son today. He's talking about like uh, he's a salesman, so he'll have these like relationships with other people. It's like you help me, I help you, whatever. And it's like it's like I imagine the demon of noonday, uh. the demon of lust, being like, "Listen, okay, check it out, lust. I'll kick you guys a couple couple million over here. You know what I mean? But uh, you gotta make sure to give me my my cut on top. But like the whole time he knows he's gonna get even double. You know what I mean? The, me, meaning the the demon of lust because yeah. he's like, sure, no problem. Because ultimately, you know, whatever I get from you, from people wanting to be distracted." It's like it's gonna come back around. I got them, you know. So it's it's pretty rough, man. It's pretty rough. Uh, we, yeah. we invited in, you know what I mean. So, Cyprian, you were gonna say something. I oh, okay. I think Father said it all. There's nothing. I mean, <laughs> I can well, and it's just <laughs> that's just truth. That's just truth right there. That's just, it's weird. It, I th I think the one thing that I would say is like. And I've, I keep hearing this from like, I'm hearing it more and more every day from people in my circle, even even today to where people are like, this powers and principalities thing, not only is it like, not only are they saying this is real, this is legit, uh, I get it now. But what I'm hearing more and more is like, it's the only way that anything makes any sense. Yeah, well, that was Naomi Wolf, wasn't it? Did you read her did article? She say, I I read it. Did she? I guess she kind of did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was from like early idea, last right? year, wasn't it? Like was early like last whole, year. Yeah, that was like her yes. whole thesis statement, was wasn't the, it? And I, I and I mean, I'm hearing it. I mean, I'm hearing it. You know, just constantly where people are like, it's the only way that it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, and that's to me, that's actually kind of. To me, that's one of the scary things because yeah. the people, the materialists who are like, just refuse it. They're like this. I just refuse to even entertain this on principle. Yeah, they're just they're just flailing out there. Well, what's they have crazy, no clue what's I mean, going on. I mean, what's crazy to me is like, hmm, you know, like hoping the best, wanting to be charitable, and you know, God knows and everything. Um, but think about a cat like Alex Jones, right? Who, okay, whatever, you know, and and. This is going to be a hard kind of rabbit trail, so don't let me get too far out in the weeds with this one. But like, I, the my concern kind of hit this um, a little bit after the the kind of energy, the party died down. Everyone's picking up the bottles from the Kanye, uh, Milo, Fuentes thing. Remember, like it's like okay, it's like here's the zenith of the party that's like okay party's over and like okay you know waking the drunks up get out of here whatever but like looking back after that it's like there's these moments where it's like man it, it's it's really concerning because um you guys i'm sure you've seen it but you know there's that real famous it's well, i don't know how famous it is but it's that clip of alex jones and he's on um, the on talking with joe rogan and he's just He's in the zone, you know, just kind of like laying everything out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The appearance with Eddie Bravo, where he's yep. wearing the NASA, yep. NASA shirt. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yep. He's yep. Just, of course. He's laying everything out, okay? See, the only problem with all that is, is this, right? It's all good. But we were talking, was it last week we were talking about the Heralds, right? And just kind yeah. of like, you know, the need to Woody Harrelson? Them. I'm not saying... <laughs> How, how do I say this? Like, <laughs> these people who kind of like suss it out and they figure it out. The, the problem is, is it's like, okay, that's great. Naomi Wolf and everyone else. And even Alex Jones, it's great that you get to this point where you go like Prince. It's the demons. It's the whatever, however you want to call them. Okay, great. But that's not enough. You know what I mean? It's it's not enough to be like it's the demons, whatever. It's only half the story. It's not only half the half, story. Not even half. Yeah. And and so you even get to this point where it's like you know Alex Jones, Christ. Okay, great. But here's the big thing, right? Like a lot of these people, they still think that they're waiting for the rapture to come. You know what I mean? Sure. So so this is where it's like they don't get into this actual place where the battle is fought, right? 
they don't get to this place where no, 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 the battle is fought really primarily on the <laughs> immaterial, psychological, spiritual realm. And so if you don't understand passions, which they don't, right? I mean, think about, think about, think about your average evangelical Protestant, right? And then maybe think about at least, you know, your average Roman Catholic. And then think about kind of, I mean, God help us, but think about your kind of, you know, um, ah, no offense to anyone, but you're just kind of like you're a cultural Orthodox person, like, there, this idea of the passions and doing things, it's like, oh, that's for the monks, that's for whatever. And so all the while, it's like, I go to church, it's all good, blah, blah, which is great. I mean, it's great. But if you don't understand how all this is happening on the level of your passions, your appetites, you know what I mean? Like the way that you give rights, as St. Paisis would say, it's like, this is precisely where when the master says, you know, if not for the elect, you know, it's like e even the elect will be deceived, right? And mm -hmm. and it starts making a lot more sense, and it starts getting a lot more scarier because all the evangelicals think that they're going to know. You know what I mean? We're going to know. We're going to see him, whatever. But it's like getting back to what we were talking about with the Hegelian dialectic. It's like they're all still falling for the for these traps because the inability. And I do say an inability to look inward, that that is being fostered more and more, right? And so that inability, it produces a, eventually an unwillingness to, to want to look inward, right? So not only are you unable, but you're unwilling because you, because of your inability, you think, well, that doesn't matter if I just have kind of like the checkbox mm. of, of whatever my religious kind of like disposition, or for a lot of people, my political disposition, I'm anti-wokey, I'm anti, you know, pharma, I'm anti-globalist, which is good. I'm, I'm anti all those things too, but it's not enough. You know what I mean? And it's all external. It's all external. It's, and, and that's why monasticism, I mean, how could you have monasticism if that's the context of your faith? Because you would be like, well, even if you believed in spiritual warfare, mm -hmm. right? You would be like, wait, yeah, there's a, there's a war going on. If you don't understand the passions, yeah, there's a war going on. So how is that hermit in a cave? Mm -hmm. How is he fighting the war? And it's like, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. He's the one fighting. That's right. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. a common. You're not can... fighting. He's the one fighting. That's right. There was this right. guy that came into my work and he's through a fellowship or whatever. He's like a old Catholic bishop or something like that. It's really weird. I'm not sure I understand the situation. But he um, saw my icons and he came in and he was like, he's kind of talking to me for a little while. And he's gay. So I don't know what's going on there. It's just, it's just a weird. What? I know. I, I'm going to leave it there. That's that's <laughs> it. But it was this whole weird thing. And he was talking to me and he said something about um, he looked at the icons and then he was like, oh, you know, are you, are you Eastern Orthodox? So I was like, yeah. And so some conversation went time a little bit later. And then just in this like really bitey tone, I I said I make this comparison a lot, but it's like that in the Fellowship of the Ring movie, where like Frodo or Bilbo reaches for the ring and he's like Argh! for like one second, you see like yeah. it go over his face or whatever. Yeah. I saw him come out and he's like, Yeah, you know, we, we go out every Saturday because you know, unlike us, we don't hide in monasteries and something like oh, that. He was like, We God. yeah, it, he was like that's one accusation made against the Orthodox is they just worry about their own faith all the time. Well, here's the thing. First of all, someone shows you who they are, believe them. Don't be so sure that it wasn't something coming out. You know what I mean? Oh, well, because... I, I do see it. I see yeah. it fairly frequently with people. Yeah, because, you know, remember, Satan is the accuser. Um, and so, anyways, that whole, that whole thorough line of... Okay, navel gazers, right? Because that navel gazer, I mean, that term is it you originates. Stare, you stare at your own bar, bar, bar long, long, right? Yeah. That was the, that's uh, right. It originates yeah, bar with bar long, yeah. you know, accusing the hesychasts. Um, and so this this whole movement of not just spiritual warfare and how to you know not only deal with one's passions but deal with the demons. But the, the other side of that, which is the actual encounter with the living God, 
You know what I mean? And and because when you start going down that line, I think the people outside the tradition, they it it it's that same thing where you're just, hey, how you doing? Here's some snacks, here's an ottoman, here's here's everything I can do to make you comfortable. And then they're like, oh, you Orthodox are so arrogant. It's like, what? <laughs> like, hold on. What? I just offered you some snacks and an ottoman. It's like, you Orthodox, you think that you're like, you know what I mean? So if you haven't had that experience yet, just wait, you'll have it. Because there's this line, this invisible line that you, that you bump up against and has nothing to do with how you're talking, has nothing to do with anything. It has everything to do with this kind of unspoken reality of, well, you know, I have God on my own terms. You know what I mean? I know God too. And it's like, mm, yeah, you know, okay, sure. But what we're saying about the experience of God, not just like the speculativeness, right? Because we can get into like Aquinas and all the stuff, but like all that stuff is speculative. And, and I think that's the thing that we have to always come back to is the fact that in our tradition, it's empirical, as St. Sophroni says, it's like the fathers are sharing experience of God, experience of the passions, experience of the demons. So therefore, if you do these things, you will encounter the truth of it. Now, that being said, people are like, well, my, my tradition's old, my this and that, you know, and we, you know, unlike you guys, you know, we are for social justice or whatever the external thing is, it will always come back down to something external and material. Um, and I think that this is one of those tip, well, this is one of those traps that the devil lays out for us to kind of always draw us out because we encounter God inward. You know what I mean? Yeah. We encounter God, you know, in the heart and philosophy, um, religious, um, the the external facets of religion in an exclusive kind of context, all those things ultimately like seek to, to kind of pull you out. If you if you know what I mean, pull you out from within. And if you're getting pulled out from within, that's where you become really vulnerable to temptations, demonic attack, and essentially those attacks begin to wear wear down those connection points with God. You know, it's like so. Go ahead. It's like the person who's constantly like talking about the truth of orthodoxy and stuff, but they maybe go to church like once a month or yeah. something like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. They like, never pray. They don't, you know, um, they scream it's just at someone. intellectual and theoretical for them. Yeah. Intellectual, theoretical. And they'll scream at someone like, I'm trying to do the Jesus prayer. Shut up. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, totally. <laughs> something crazy like that, you know? Um, but but it's interesting because all of this stuff that we were talking about earlier, it kind of comes down to this whole reality of consumption and consumer. And it gets us in that mindset of consum consuming and consum consumption, um, becoming consumers, and we begin to approach our faith like that. And I think that's one of the things that we have to wake up to in order to um, get back to this true warfare because consumption i'll tell you what you know somebody may graduate and be like i used to self-abuse or i used to you know drink too much or i used to do whatever but like are you running to amazon when you're feeling kind of down you know what i mean yeah are you because this is a whole shift right that whole quote-unquote addictive um disposition you know it's like it's like our old friend Robert talking about like being addicted to the world, right? Like that, that whole movement of addiction and, and wanting to, whether it's, you know, look at a woman through the screen or buy a new pair of shoes or buy an accessory for your car, like anything to get you outside of yourself. Cause that's why you do it. Um, you're doing it to not deal with like the warfare within. And that's, that's really tough and crazy, but that's where God calls us to really do this battle first and foremost, you know? So I, I just had a question. If you need to finish your statement, go ahead, Father. Well, I was just going to say my, my kind of like cap on that was you really see that like second, third week of Lent, 
Cause like, you're kind of like, okay, you're getting acclimated to, you know, fasting, you're getting acclimated to the extra prayer, or whatever. Okay. First week, the novelty, you're excited. Second week, kind of rough. You, you've made your mistakes. But by the third week, you're like, okay, like you got whatever rhythm it is. You know what I mean? It's kind of like whatever stumbling you're doing, like third week now you're finding your rhythm, whether it's a slower or faster one than you've had before, it doesn't matter, but you're in it. And that rhythm begins to really kind of like tell a lot of things, you know, and we all experience the demons coming out. Why? Because we're putting attention to our inner lives. We're, yeah. we're, we're putting attention to prayer. And so there's no mistake and there's no coincidence that like the purple demons and the Linton temptations come up. You know what I mean? Um, because everyone is supposed to be at least um, less distracted. And I have a theory. This is just a theory. But Lent has felt very different the last like seven, seven years or so, eight years. And I feel like it's starting because to feel you met me. It's because you yes. met me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I I feel like it's it. I feel like more and more people are feeling different. Like me, give you an example. I remember, you know, it would be kind of a thing like I'm going to fast for social media, whatever. But now that's a real common thing that people think about. Like I want to get off social media. I'll see you later. Blah blah blah. And I think that as we're getting further and further in the quicksand of this disembodied, um, you know, disincarnate consumerist consumption lifestyle, we're seeing kind of imperceptibly, maybe, maybe not so imperceptibly, how it's affecting us. And then Lent has a whole different meaning now than it did 20 years ago because of it. Hmm. You know I mean? this yeah. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. But you know how, like, it's like um, maybe, I'm trying to think of a good, good example, but like, Maybe it's like if um, you're out with like your kid or something like that and something kind of dangerous maybe happens in front of you, maybe like a homeless guy starts screaming or something mm -hmm. and then you like put your hand down in front of the kid or something like that. But then you realize like you didn't remember doing that, mm -hmm. but like some part of you has just mm -hmm. known like this needs to happen. Maybe that's like the social media thing. It's just like right away you're like, oh, yep, this is something that needs to like, this is an open wound for me. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure that this is, but about the... um the things coming out because you're being you know it's the lent and stuff like that my baptizing priest father james used to always say he, he's um he's working the air bubbles out of you it's like when you're making a uh, prosphora mm -hmm. you're working all the air bubbles out you know and then he's pressing a seal you got to make sure that those air bubbles are out because when you're offered up as a sacrifice you can't be falling all over the place like it's got to be one strong central mm -hmm. core bread and so like he's talking about that pain of like your withdrawal from whatever that's like your air bubbles being worked out um and then i had a question for you but i can't remember what it was um well this is probably a really good time to i mean should we do the talk about prayer of saint Ephraim the the syrian i think this is the perfect segue sure. talking about the battle moving inwards to to do battle during lent i mean yeah if we're going to do that, can I ask a question really really fast? This is yeah. a diff different one I wanted to ask tonight. I have never known, and it's because I am a bad Christian, it's just the end of it, is why is it pre-sanctified? Why do we only do pre-sanctified liturgies like or the sure. Sure. during the week? What's up sure. with pre-sanctified? So pre-sanctified means that um, the, the host, the, the lamb has been consecrated already. Right. And why is that? And so, oh yeah, you're getting there. So why is that? Um, is because it's to bring forth um, a more, more kind of like penitential nature of Lent, because the liturgy is a celebration, right? And so, um, the liturgy is a celebration. There's joy. There's there's all this brightness and everything. Um. But during Lent, obviously, there's there's a greater emphasis on you know repentance and the, again the penitential nature of it. And so um, it's funny because it's I, it's in the dismissal prayer actually um, for the for the pre-sanctified liturgy um, 
but it talks about how it, it this has been revealed you know the, how the pre-sanctified liturgy is a revelation that was given to us as a kind of like it doesn't say consolation but that's the inference there you know this the revelation of this liturgy and the the pre-sanctified liturgy as you know as anyone who's experienced it it is qualitatively a like the liturgy is the holiest thing in the world obviously but it's it's a qualitatively kind of different kind of holiness. Oh, like, man. Uh, the pre-sanctifieds yes. are just wow. You know, pre-sanctified liturgy are just they're 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 really heavy, and the holiness is just off the charts for them. And um, and so remember in Lent everything is um the in the same way the adoration of Christ's sacrifice is coming to a more and more explicit um, fervor, temperature, you know, uh, everything's moving towards that, towards Holy Week and, of course, um, Pascha. But this this kind of, you know, um, this adulation, there's this kind of, um, this pulse that's, that's, you know, like getting stronger and stronger through Lent of the sacrifice of our of the lord you know this um cosmic event that just rips the the veil in two not just the veil of the temple but the veil of time mm. the veil of the cosmos was written to at the at, at at the cross and so the pre-sanctified liturgy brings us forward um so yeah it's man does that answer your question why oh why and then some and then some so it's just like more room for uh like it, it like removes some of the parts of the liturgy so that we can focus more on like repentance and stuff. Is no, that... it doesn't no, it's it's yes, yes, it removes parts of the liturgy, but it or it does them ahead of time. It does it ahead of time. So like yeah. so I mean like the priest con consecrates the during the during the liturgy the the previous Sunday another another lamb is set aside and it's um it's interesting tinctured, it's in tinctured with the blood so oh. it's 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 the whole host you know the the body and the blood and it's <laughs> set aside and, and then it's partaken of now you know the the heaviness the holiness is tangible for the priest and for everyone there you know but the, that whole process of you know preparing the lamb and then having the pre-sanctified and it's tough because you know there's there's a whole those um there's these three really four but these three um antiphons that are just incredible and so the priest will remove the, the lamb and then then the second one the the priest will sense around the altar and the priest moves it from the altar to the oblation table and um those movements uh are again they're dread they're very dread movements mm. at least for me as a priest you know and so you can feel it i mean i remember even before being a priest you know being a layman and just i don't know you could feel it radiating out of the altar you know the the heaviness of it and it really is um i think this uh when we talk about how, you know, I, I've been saying throughout, throughout like on Wednesday liturgies, um, to pre sanctified, you know, you start seeing this movement of things are changing. The music changes. Sure. You notice that the, um, the colors, the liturgical colors change. They go dark, right? They, we go into purple, right? And, uh, hopefully people are getting dark purple, you know? And so it's like, um, these, these movements begin to happen. We're fasting, um, and of course, the music is more penitential, and if that was even possible, St. Mary's, you know, things yeah, become real. more penitential. But by the time we we start hitting that pre, that first pre sanctified after the canon of St. Andrew, which is incredible, right? I mean, you start really. Um, it's like anyone who hasn't experienced the first week of Lent, moving into like obviously, you know all of Lent, but getting like Holy Week, it's like you can't really experience what the church 
is and has until you've gone through that in the sense that, um, you know, you have a friend and like you guys are bros, it's all good, but you're not really tight until you've seen your friend cry. Sure. I mean, you don't really know someone until you've been with them and they've wept. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is the movement. Um, this is what happens in Lent and this, and again, I mean, even when we get into Lazarus Saturday, right. The, the shortest verse in the scripture, when the most powerful Jesus wept, Mm. right. So this, this weeping, um, and we call it the bright sadness. It really comes forward. And the, I mean, the pre-sanctified liturgies are just kind of like the par excellence of what that, what that looks like, you know, and it's a big reason why the joy of Pascha is so insane, you know, the top. You know, Dude. because we've been we've been lamenting, you know, and you know, next week or this week coming up is um the week of Saint John of the Ladder. And if anyone's ever read the ladder, which I don't necessarily advise, <laughs> but um I mean the, one of the reasons why I don't you know we, we one of the reasons why the ladder isn't light reading and just kind of pick up is because there's portions in there like the beginning part where it talks about the prison. There's mm-hmm. a sub there's part where it talks about the prison, it's just like you read that, you read about these people who just, these monks who are basically in hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just their eyelashes falling out from weeping as you read it. And if you don't have a context of, of repentance, you can read that stuff and be like, this is deranged. What is this? You know? Oh, yeah. That was not my reaction. My reaction was like that. That Nazi guy at the end of Indiana Jones and the Lost. I'm just like, my eyes were melting. And I was just like, oh, I just got to yeah. put this back. And just, I just like, <laughs> I instantly just felt so terrible. I was just like, I don't do any of this. This is not, I can't, I, I have no context see, for this. Forgive me. And this gets us back to kind of what we we're talking about earlier. We're like, and I, I mean this not as pointing fingers, not in the weird kind of triumphalism. But in like I I because I, I I was there I know it I have people who I love who are still kind of there, but that's the thing that's really sad and scary about a lot of evangelicals is just like their whole understanding of God is so one dimensional and flat and like a bad Doris Day movie or not Doris Day like um uh yeah Doris Day whatever like or just I'm, a re- what just are you a really for? cheesy just everything's you know kirk cameron, oh like, you know what i mean I like a hallmark kirk cameron the whole Hall- yeah, hallmark style yeah hey, like, let's not bounce kirk cameron too much like, that just you know, that's rough man i mean in all seriousness though that that's really rough because you know there's people who they oh the man that that's too dark or like no no like no the lord wants you to just be in mm-hmm. in joy and happiness and Running through the fields, brother. It's just like, no, oh man, no. you don't know the Lord, dude. You yeah. know, you know what I mean. You know, so um, well, and it also denies spiritual warfare mm-hmm. because you're like, well, well, you gotta have if you're gonna it, go to war, you gotta have your special forces, man. There, that's the Navy SEALs of spiritual warfare, it. right there. You know that's, what I mean? It's it. dangerous because then I I see this a lot, and but then corrections are perceived as attacks from the enemy like ah, bingo yeah so bingo. like bingo. St- something bad will happen but oh satan's really getting after me today i'm like bingo. or your heart is really hard yep. like yeah like maybe you're not willing to accept that like and so let me just throw this at you because i'm just throwing this out there forgive me i shouldn't do this because people are going to probably run with it but it is a it is a way of understanding the blasphemy of the holy spirit Hmm. Because when you start a, when you start accounting the work of God to Satan, oh, you see what I mean? Ooh. Satan's out. It's like no, no, no. What if that's the hand of God? What if God's trying to chastise you because He loves you, but because you have this, you know, um, like uh, exchange based relationship with God or just like, you know, you're a pagan, basically like I do this for God and God makes me happy. You know what I mean? Prosperity gospel style. Prosperity gospel style. And there's, I mean, there's people who are like that. I mean, 
you know, there, there's people who, um, that it's just, it's really dangerous, man. Because if you're, if you, if you live in such a way <laughs> where you can't receive a hard word, I, I feel very comfortable. Yes, I'll say it. I feel very comfortable. If you live in such a way you cannot receive a hard word ever, we all have a hard time. Don't don't get, don't misread me here. But if you can't ever receive a hard word, I would say your salvation's in danger. Just, yeah, just straight up. Because if everything's well, it seems be- necessarily so, Father, right? Like because isn't I mean repentance would require it requires it. It yeah. requires it. That's this whole. So if you're the cat who's like. You know, I can't. God can only come to me unless He's bringing me candy and sugar. I'm like, whoa, and that's how some people, Orthodox, quote unquote, that's how some people are, and it's it's really sad and it's really dangerous because that's how most of evangelicalism is, um, and 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 again, it's just how a lot of Americans are in their approach to God. You know what I mean? And so that's what that's in some regards why Orthodoxy, why it's so important for people. Hopefully, I mean, maybe this is one of the things about our project, hopefully, is hopefully there's been some people here who have been like, okay, I see the need to, like, take the hard thing from God's hand. Mm. You know what I mean? That it isn't just it isn't just kind of like, um, yeah, I, I've had escargot. That's cool. Like, they don't look at the difficult things as a kind of exotic hors d'oeuvre, spiritually speaking. But they begin to realize, no, this is the meat. This is the medicine by which I'm actually going to be purified are these di- trials, temptations, like the things that chastisements, the things that God allows to come to us. They're there to facilitate the repentance. And repentance is the greatest, awesomest, most amazing thing. But you'll never know it because, you know, you you want you want cotton candy, which is disgusting from God all the time. Yeah, you know I mean, and, and it's like, a lot like. Forgive me, I just want to say this because I've I've had. I'm thankful. I'm so thankful to God. I'm so. I mean, I'm so thankful to God for the life He's given me because it's just been so rich. And I have had the experience of being in places of my own immaturity, my own superficiality my own arrogance, my own pride, which I'm sure I'm there still and all those things, that's fine. But I've had these moments in life, whether it's learning an instrument, thinking I was better than I was, <laughs> um, you know, learning a different technique in regards of art, raising children, <laughs> loving my wife, being a priest, being a friend. I've had, I've had these moments in almost every aspect of my life where God has shown me, you are not as good as you think you are. Uh. And he's challenged me. And I tried to really strive to be not for anyone else's sake, but between God and I to, to meet those challenges, not because I look at God as like an exercise program, but because I love him and I just, I, I, I want his will in my life. But when you actually do that thing, that's hard. And you get to this point where like, I couldn't play that three years ago. I can play this now. Mm. I couldn't do this, you know, six months ago. I can do it now. That's an incredible feeling. It's, it's an incredible feeling. And, and what I'm trying to get at is that's what repentance is. When you actually engage repentance and not just kind of like, okay, I guess I'll go to church, God. Like, But you actually get into it. You lean into it. It is incredible. It is it is the life and the abundant life that Christ promised us. But like, this is why you got all these charlatans and guys, people running around because everyone's thinking like that abundant life means you know, I need to get, I need to have the wife with the big rack. I need to have the car and this and that, you know, with the gun, like all the stuff. And it's like, they're never happy, but for whatever reason, they got weird religious guilt and they got to say like, praise the Lord, whatever. But like, at the end of the day, it's when you lean into that, that suffering of repentance, man, the, the when you come out the other side of it, when you've actually wrestled with the enemy like legit wrestled with the enemy and you've you've called on the name of the lord you come on the other side of it it's it's incredible and that is the life we're supposed to be living and you can only get that through the cross you know what i mean it's and like that's that, why all this stuff is so dangerous it's like that part in um the movie fight club 
where he grabs that convenience store clerk and holds a he doesn't know it but an empty gun to the back of his head Mm -hmm. and he's just like if you don't go and become like a veterinarian or whatever the guy wanted to do by this time next year like i'll come back i'll find you and i'll kill you and like and then whatever edward norton's like he's like why'd you do that he's like tomorrow will be the best day of that dude's life like he will have the best meal he will have the he will like everything will be sunnier and warmer and like warmer and happier because like when you go through that you know, I don't know if I'm using this term correctly, but like dark night of the soul or whatever, mm-hmm. like, and you come out the other side, it's just like, not only did I learn, I can survive that with the help of God, which is like, I spend so much of my life worrying, I'm not going to survive that, mm-hmm. but I can survive it. It's not as scary as I thought it was going to be, even though it was plenty scary. There are times I definitely thought I was going to like, not physically die, but you know, I was going to die and I came out the other side and stronger like that's you know and that see, and that's awesome. exactly why lent is such a gift like lent is really a tithe to god you know what i mean it's like it's this you know it's this tithe giving back to god and so it's like what are you talking about blah, blah, blah read about dorothea so i'll tell you but like lent the fathers give us lent and it's this tithe back to god of time but Ultimately, like with anything else, God doesn't need anything from us. And it ends up being a gift for us. And that exact thing, that's what Lent is every year. It's like you come out the other side of it. It's like, man, that was rough. But man, it was so good, you know, and that experience of just being pushed to the edge and falling down, getting back up, you know, being tempted, you know, being with others, like being forgiven. Right. We start off with forgiveness. Um, asking forgiveness, but being forgiven and forgiving others. I mean, all, all the deep movements of, of what it means to be um, a human in, in this world and in the, in, in the kingdom of God, it's like, it all comes through during Lent. And it's, it's that exact experience of coming through the other side every year. It's a real gift. I mean, the reframe of abundance, right? So it's like Mm -hmm. abundance as versus scarcity, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that there's the you know as you were talking about like this idea that people have this 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 worldly idea of scarcity to where it's like even like andrew tate tweeting out oh you need to get you need to get rich be yeah, everybody needs to you, you need to go and get rich if, if because wealth is the key to something or wealth is the key to power so god wants you to be rich or something like that which is total prosperity gospel and it's like well that's your, you're, you're just scared. You're living in a world of fear and the scarcity you're, you're, you're scared because you believe that there's lack rather than being like, Oh no, actually. And I guess this is, this is storing up your treasures in heaven. Right. Is that actually you're like, Oh no, 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 no. Like there is no, that scarcity isn't there. The abundance is in the strength that can come from God. Well, what's crazy is again, I mean, that is what Lent does. I mean, Lent, like you face the demons, you face yourself, but then ultimately it all comes into this place where it's like, it, it's almost, um, uh, it's almost like, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, it's like the battle's going on. And then all of a sudden it's like, I can't remember, like it happens in a couple of different scenes. Like um, the witch king shows up and it's just like, mm-hmm. everything stops. It's like, uh oh, like, who's that? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, or like those moments where it's like stuff's going on, then like uh, Gandalf comes on the scene. It's like, okay, everything clears out. But it's like, we're in this melee. You know what I mean? We're, we're in spiritual warfare. We're fighting with the, with the demons. We're fighting with each other, you know, our passions. And then everything comes to Holy Week and it's like, boom, the king shows up. And it's like, we're all looking at him. We're all watching him in his passion. And we're with him in his passion. And then we begin to realize this whole time he's telling, he's calling us to not fear. He's, he's mm-hmm. brought us to this place. I brought you to this place of desperation. I've called you to let go of your wealth, right? Give alms. I've called you to let go of your bodily strength fast, become weak in your body. I've called you to let go of your ego and the pride of your mind, right? The vanity, the vainglory. You know what I mean? I've called you to let go of the strength you get from war. Judge not your brother. You know what I mean? I've called you 
to lean on nothing but me, right? And 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 here is why. Boom. And then we watch him and we watch him do the cross is the zenith of reality. We we watch him. Let's forgive me. This was like the thing. I'm just, I am so in love with Christ. Just I'm in this glow from the cross. He, everybody has failed us. He's the only one who hasn't failed us. Yeah. And everything, his movement on the cross. All, he is nobility. He is heroism. He is love. He is that act on the cross is everything. And so our whole, not even our whole individual lives, but the whole sum of what it means to be human comes into this incredible moment where it's like everything we've been stripped of everything. And we see like that, like we've been stripped of it all to see him. And it's funny because I was thinking about this. I didn't make it in the homily, but I, I was really meditating on this in the fact that we're, we've come to this place. It may not be the exact end of times, but it's the end of days. It always is, right? But like we're closer to it than we've ever been. Even if we have another 5,000 years, we're closer to it than we've ever been right now, right? And it's like everything is falling apart. Everything is also at the same time being set up. And it's like, we're watching the darkness um, creep and grow. And there's many of us who are like hoping, but it's like I was telling a brother today, you know, um, it's all inevitable. Like we can, we can repent and may God help us to repent. We can slow it down. We can kick the can, but it's, it's inevitable. Like the CBDCs, um, conflict, like all this stuff that's, that's happening on an economic political, social level, material level, the principalities are pushing it. That's why <laughs> it's a fool's game to think like, you know, these we, these cats like, we're going to beat the new world order. We're going to beat them. We're going to beat the elites. It's like, no, yeah, we got to resist and stop we're, this. Yeah, it's like, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. No, no, no. Like, stop that. You know what I mean? What we need to do is we need to buy enough time to repent, right? This is old hat for us. We've been saying this, you know, as long as we've been doing these podcasts, but the point I'm trying to get at is he's a jealous God. He's he's going to make sure that there's no idol left. Just like in Lent, he calls us to just strip it all away. And that's what's happening in world history right now. Everything's being stripped away and everything is pointing to the final and the greatest act, which is him on the cross. And it isn't because he's petty. It isn't because he's a narcissist. It's because he is life. And he says, there is no other life but me. I am life. I created all things. And this is how I'm drawing all things unto me. And how could you not want to participate in that? You know? Well, well there's the, like a... so people are people are holding on so much of the like, you know, the, the, it's, it is, you, if you see it, you see it is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that it, these crises happen, things are crumbling and people are like, Oh no, but we've how do we how do we prop it up? Like it shouldn't be crumbling. And it's like, no, 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 no. You weren't supposed to have that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that's not you weren't supposed to have that. It was going to crumble. Which is it's crazy because uh we don't want to get it too much into it. We want to want to be polite and everything, but you know, there's these people, man. It's like I don't know. I just it, it's always a balance, right? Because we have to be busy, right? We have to be busy. We have to be holding the territory we're given, right? But at the same time, it's like when you start moving and trying to make like movements are gonna like if you're thinking <laughs> if you're if you're looking to build an arc that isn't the arc, you know, I think you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking to build an arc with the C and <laughs> and it's not the arc, right? of Christ it's like what are you doing you know like what are you what are you really doing and and the reason why i'm saying this is because um like as orthodox we 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 shouldn't get mad about the fall of byzantium we shouldn't we shouldn't get mad about you know the the chastisement of the church of russia under the bolsheviks and the godless communists we shouldn't get mad about these things we should go like yeah 
this is what he's doing. It's like everything is, everything is, is, it's like the cross is the center of everything. It's like the cross is this, it's the black hole. That's a weird statement, but you know what I mean? It's like all matter is just being drawn into there. Past and it's, present. It's, past the, the it's the thing with the greatest mass. It's the greatest possible. mass. It's got it's got a gravity well. It's good. Yeah, Perfect. it's bigger than anything. It's bigger than so anything. So there, so therefore, it's got the biggest draw right. of anything that could possibly have a draw. And yeah. so, and so, it was like with Kili asthma, all these things. It's like this is again, this is like our theme, I guess. But like that's what we're called to, and. And again, for me, just this year with the cross, you know, coming, we're in the shadow of the cross. It's like, it was just, uh, just so tangible. And it was like, yes. And this is why worship is everything because worship is eternal and, and worshiping him and adoration. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, this is heaven. Worshiping him is heaven. You know what I mean? And so Lent is such a gift that yeah. was one sorry father yeah go ahead that was one of the first things that like i realized and this is i don't know this is maybe the thought i need to re-examine but <clears throat> like uh i was listening to a podcast i was probably like six months orthodox or something and one of the priests the priest who i think was who is the um, priest he's a big time on ancient faith um father thomas hopko father thomas mm-hmm. hopko was talking about uh you know a, 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 a memory a blessed memory, memory, blessed eternal, memory, yeah. mm-hmm. a blessed memory. Um, he uh, was talking about, he's like, well, what are we going to do in heaven? He's like, we're going to worship God. He's like, I'm sorry if that's not romantic enough for people. And it, at or the if time, you think that's boring, you know? <laughs> yeah. And at the time I was kind of like, that's it. And like, what, well, what does worship actually do? Like, what is worship? You know, is it just sitting and just singing? Like, okay like we're still singing like okay like no that's not worship and not only that but like the thought popped in my head is like well we're all looking for that thing to constantly talk about like when i talk to a stranger now it's the weather or the chiefs or whatever but like in heaven it's we'll always have the thing to talk about we'll always have we'll have that core that centrality to our existence that we've always been craving that it will comes. always nurture us. That's the thing. It will always nurture us. There will be no end. Because his essence, this is St. Gregor Palmas, right? Uh, the second week of Lent, right? Like, essence, energies. Like, there is, we'll, we, we will not know his essence. Not now, not ever. This is why you need patience. Because we will be forever searching and growing in the knowledge of him. And instead of the the kind of gamble that we all play here it's like you may run into me i may give you something really edifying i may talk to you about something you don't care about it's a gamble right there will be no gamble yeah you know what i mean because everything will be all he will be all you know he will be all in all and don't know how it's going to work exactly but i do know that um like our the goal of our lives now is like we're all striving to become quote unquote more and more orthodox, meaning not the affect, hopefully, but in the sense of our orientation and our inner life is more and more integrated. The dichotomies where there isn't like, well, here's my church life, here's my whatever life. It's like those things are being removed and everything is circling around him, like getting back to that, um, what do you call a Cyprian gravity mass, you know, gravity well, gravity well, gravity yeah. well. it's all, it's that the cross being this body, right. If we're thinking about it, like a planet or whatever, it's like growing within us, you know what I mean? And everything is being attracted and being brought to it. That's and the what depth and the depth is endless. endless. I, think that, I think that's Andrew, like that's the hard thing. And you know, I think that this is this is probably one of the reasons why, you know, there is such a broad swath of like psychonauts, like people who have experienced psychedelics who are like get orthodoxy like quickly. Mm-hmm. They get it. It's 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 that it's the like, you know, just having a brief glimmer of this idea of like time really vanishing and like your attention being 
held 100% mm-hmm. in the mystical, you know what I mean? And being and like the vastness yeah, of that, the vastness right, where people right. are like, I was there right. for 2000 years. And they were like, dude, you were out for 10 seconds. Right, right. now, right. And it's like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. I witnessed you know. birth and, and creation and death over and over and over again. Like, and that's, and that's a, that's a glimmer, I know. you know, to, to know that it's like, yeah, that's a glimmer of, of like, because what we're being offered is so is, is like, we is unimaginably greater and deeper than that. Maybe, then you're like, okay, maybe it's time. Okay. Maybe it's been too long, but maybe it's time in the next couple of episodes, we should show that onion video again. Yeah, of the, probably of the interview with yeah. God. I could probably find it now. Yeah, I mean, sure, why not? But I and I feel like now. I have to say this because we mentioned the arc a minute a minute ago, mm-hmm. and apparently, and for those not in the know, I'd be a bad host if I didn't say. Um, I guess Jordan Peterson starting his own quasi religious thing, and that's what we're referencing. It's the ARC or something like that, and it's it it's the it's the logical conclusion. I mean, of where he's going. I mean, it's the logical, like, I mean, absolutely. If someone was familiar with the situation, they could have plotted out. Well, eventually this guy's going to start his own thing. Like, so, um, and, and then, by thing, you mean religion. Uh, yeah. I think you mean religion. Uh, yeah. Religion. I'm comfortable saying that. And then father, I had never realized this before, but you're talking about like the fall of Byzantium and I, and St. Nikolai Velimirovich, as he always does, reframed the, Fall of Byzantium and the transfer over to Russia in a way I'd never heard before. Mm. He's like, with the last council, I think it was the commemoration of the triumph of orthodoxy. He's like, with the last council, orthodoxy was now purified and ready to give to the Russians. Mm. Like, I I had never realized that before. He was just like... Man, St. Nikolai, man. He He kills it. He absolutely kills it. Like Serbian Chrysostom. Absolutely. I... I, there's this book of letters he wrote and um every once in a while, oh yeah that was one of my favorite things i i say this to people a lot there's this guy who wrote in to him basically worried about overpopulation and his response is like the first paragraph is like what an odd thing to be worried about that's just <laughs> like that's so weird you would be worried about that like mm-hmm. god's not gonna provide for us like why would we why yeah. why are, he's like don't worry about this this is not a thing for you he's like we don't even know that this is the time that has the most human beings right. we don't even know that like yeah, they there could have been more there could have been right? more yeah well that's yeah, sure. that's what the devil's always do is trying to get us with scarcity right scarcity, scarcity yep. there oh, it no, is. No, no, Scar- you, scarcity and fear scarcity fear no, there's not hand. enough for you there's not enough yeah, for you they go you hand better go hand. take it from him you know what I mean? Okay, so do you, do we want to do this? Yeah, do we want yeah, to why not? With God? This okay. is a good video. We haven't showed it in a while, so here we go. Can you guys hear it? Tonight, yeah. something truly extraordinary. I've been afforded the divine privilege to sit down with, in an exclusive interview, our celestial creator, God. God, thank you for joining <laughs> And the tree yeah. the tree always gets me yeah apologies to people who've been with us for like a long time but it's good you know <laughs> that's a great i don't know man i if that could be our intro i would that would be our intro every week i would <laughs> it's, do it's it. worth what it's worth watching every once in a while it's I, worth watching every once in a while yeah, yeah. and the thing i'll say we, and I'll, we'll start to wrap up here i guess in a minute but the yes. thing i wanted to say is to to the point that father was talking about earlier that uh, there are people who want God to just bring them cotton candy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that there is like, at least with the men I work with, at least the affect of knowing in some sense that that is incredibly wrong. Because like when I 
because that is kind of the emphasis given to them. Well, the men that you work with, as in like fellow or the people who are you're serving, the the people I'm counseling. Well, people- that's it right there. Because the people who want cotton candy, they're the people who are already living pretty well. It's always the look, man. Okay. Christ came for the sick, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why. And, and I forgive me. It's it's just the common thing. It's like people who. It's an it's a it's a cliche, but there's truth to it. People who have nothing, people who are suffering. Um, those who've been forgiven much, love much. That's that's the truth of it. The, the people who got it all polished. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's well because you don't want that to end. At mm-hmm. the point when you feel like, like, oh, things are good, you're like, ooh. Well, we saw this over the last three years, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, and Upton Upton Sinclair, yeah, he's got this mm-hmm. quote. I love the quote where he says, um, "It's difficult to what? Is, what is it? It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it." Wow! Mm. Wow! Right? Yeah. I love that quote. Wow. I love that quote, and it's like. Yeah. And 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 look, of all people, I definitely understand that crisis. You know what I mean? And were it I I've, it's it's weird during this Lent, I've definitely been thinking about this where I've been thinking about, you know, what would it have been if I hadn't have met my who, the woman who is now my wife at the time that I did and had this strong desire like because I, I mean, I've probably told this on the show, but like I met her and it it was the weirdest thing because I was like, th- very palpably, it was like, if I was ever going to have children, I'm, I would have them with this. Wo- like, if I don't have children with this woman, with this woman, I'm not going to have children. Mm. This, this was this feeling that I had about it. You know what I mean? And she and I immediately like it was and it was very immediate upon us meeting each other that we both knew like, OK. We're going to have kids together. This is what we're going to. And I had never, I mean, of all the women I'd met, I'd never had this feeling. And so mm. I was like, well, then I'll probably never have this feeling again. Right. So it's got to be, it's this one or it's nothing. And I, I've thought many times about like, well, I say that my, my, that she saved my life and particularly my daughter coming along saved my life. But it's like that, it, not, not having that. I've thought about, I've thought about it so much. It's like, well, yeah, it's I don't even know this this Lent this Lent I've I've very much been thinking about like how do we how do we even get here? My mind just went in the weirdest mm-hmm. place, Father. It just <laughs> went in the weirdest place to where I'm like everything shut down, mm-hmm. everything shut down. Mm-hmm. Be- well, well, I mean, this is forgive me. This is kind of what I was saying too. Not that you are doing this, but this is where we got to be careful. You know, mm. like you don't know how God works. And then when you have these moments where it's just like you're like literally your brain starts shutting down because you can't wrap your mind around what has transpired. And it just leads you to the fact of like, I have no idea what's next. I don't even know. That's that's ab- actually it's, at that at that moment just a minute ago. That's exactly yeah. how I felt where it's like, I don't even know where to go because I don't even know where I was like yeah. everything just yeah. mystery. Yeah. Like it just fell apart. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Very and weird then, experience. It, Live. <laughs> it, it's it's one of those things where you start to understand like when you wherever you're at it's like you're gonna find someone who's younger than you spiritually speaking or mm. whatever you know chronologically you know what i mean but then when you when you you hit this age where it gets harder and harder to especially now in our society to encounter someone ahead of you and here's what i mean by that we ha- we shuttle off our old our elderly we shut off we shuttle off our elders right and on top of that we live in such a way where it's like you have to actively work against the kind of narcissism the kind of egocentrism that like you have to actively fight against it like if you are if you're out there you're thinking to yourself I'm not egocentric. I'm not a megalomaniac. I'm not a narcissist. I'm not. I'm humble. If you actually think that, you, if you're not actively working against it, slap yourself in the face right now and wake up. Like you have to actively work against it, which is something that Lent does. But it again, it, it we need it more now than ever, right? But these things, 
work against us in the sense of we can't hear, we can't, um, we're blinded to those experiences and those voices that would be above us, that would like kind of like lead us up and into something. And so you're saying people, voices of people, 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 but also too experiences because the people point us to these experiences. Mm. Someone who's already, someone who's ahead of you spiritually, right? Listen, draw me back to, if I get too lost on this one, one of the harder things for people uh, to get, sometimes they come into the church is the whole spiritual father aspect of it. Yes. You, You know what I mean? They're like, they really, really, really struggle with that. They really, really struggle with the authority. It's baked in for Americans. We don't like it. We don't understand it. We reject it. And so therefore people, you know, it's blindly in the blind, but all of these things make it really difficult for us. So not only do we not want to hear or, or, or look for elders or people who are more experienced than us, but we actively can't have those experiences because there's no one to point in to describe what's happening. Like, how do you recognize something that you've never experienced or seen? You can't, right? That's why having a spiritual father, listening to the tradition and the canons of and the doctrines, and the dogmas of the church are so necessary because you don't have the lexicon. You don't have the language or the vernacular to understand proper spiritual experience, right? So they, the fathers and everything begin to give you the language and to help you just, you know, it's like you're, you are navigating the 40,000 leagues underneath the sea. And like, you're seeing things that are not in any encyclopedia. They're not in any zoological books. You've never seen the internet. Like you don't have the visual vocabulary to describe what you're seeing. What is that, right? Well, you need someone to point out, oh, that's a blah, 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 right? It's the same thing with the spiritual life. It's like, this is the problem. A lot of people think like, oh, I know, whatever. But like, you don't know, right? You don't know. But well, you're going to be confronted by something that that is that you don't know. You're, like you're, I mean that that simple that simple experience, Father. I now 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 and I, now I see that it needed to go in that direction. Like that simple experience of of being like, oh, you meet somebody, and it's like, and she happens to be Orthodox, and it's not even occurring to me that mm-hmm. that's the case, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, this is stop right here, stop this direction right and, now, and it's not something that like. Three Where would I? Later, how would I understand that? You. It's not like three months later you got it. It's like look how much time had passed, dude. Until you understand what I'm saying. And so this this is what I'm trying to get at. It's like, but so many people they're not open and wanting to have the guide come. They're not wanting. They're not open to that authoritative voice of the church of Christ to come in. And so what happens is they end up getting lost. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm that process becomes really, really, really damaging because when they start hitting these moments in life where it's like, okay, you're blanking out, but you know what? This right here is a moment in which you should not only grow, but get, but go deeper, right? Not just grow in the sense of mm. I've had all these amounts of experiences and I've done this with my life. I've done that in my life. Like you, be, you hit this point in your life. You're like, those things don't matter anymore. Yeah. I can only make so much money. I can only paint so many paintings. I can only have so many women. I can only have so many cars. You hit a moment where like the, the, the quantitative aspect of life doesn't do it. You have to go deeper. And mm-hmm. that depth, that's where you start having these experiences with God, which this is why philosophy and a materialist perspective, like this is why, like why bankers, these people end up committing suicide because this kind of like despair that happens. It's like, I've done all the things and I'm still here. It's like, yeah, because it isn't just a matter of, Oh, you need God to live a good moral ethical life. You need God to experience what life really is. Mm. But if you don't have the means to learn the language Forgive me again, getting back to Lent. Lent gives us a vocabulary to understand those dark spots in the tapestry. It helps us to zoom out and be like, oh, okay, like I need these dark aspects of the tapestry 
in order to get these other colors to pop out. Lit gives us the skill set and the and the vocabulary to really navigate the depth of life, the vastness of life. Look, Solomon in in the book of Ecclesiastes, with much wisdom, with the gaining of much wisdom comes much sorrow. Like people hear that, and a lot of people they like they don't even want to. That's that's a portion of scripture your pastor didn't underline. You know what I mean? He didn't highlight that in his Bible. He didn't want to talk about that. But if you want to understand God, you meditate on that. With the gaining of much wisdom comes much sorrow. That is what that is the vastness of life. That is, and what I mean by life, and it's also repentance. Forgive me, it's Father. Rep- it's also it repentance. Is, it is repentance. There's great sorrow in repentance. It, it is repentance. And the thing is, if you if you've bought the lie and you think that this life is just about you know cotton candy, you are you are living a two D life. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It is the it is the suffering that brings us into the third, fourth, fifth. Like that's where you. That's why. Look, Christ could have done it any way he wanted to. Right. Excuse me. The father laid it out this way. Christ is Christ is is faithful. Right. So if he's telling us there is no other way but through the cross, through the suffering. That should tell us something. If you really want to experience life. Right. And in the light of cosmonaut, you know, the onion video we showed, like mm-hmm. the God beyond just whatever. This is the only way. And that's why, that's why, you know, and it's my want to say, uh, the kind of like fun, wow moments of like um, obscure doctrinal things, that's all fun and dandy. Let's just put all that aside right now. And I think that's another thing about Lent. It puts everything aside like, learning about history and kind of <clears throat> something that isn't really obscure, but it's kind of obscure to you and it's all fun and blah, blah. These are debating points. All that's great and fine. Let's talk about death. Let's talk about your pain and suffering. Let's talk about um, keeping your mind in hell. Let's, let's talk about these things. And that is where we'll begin to really experience God because that's what he's told us. He said to everyone, this is where you'll find me. You'll find you you don't know him in the resurrection without the cross, right? And this is, he shows us what does it mean to be God? Here's what it means to be God. It means to suffer and die for love. Man. I'm very sorry. Did, I was looking very, very difficult. Like St. Nikolai had a great quote. And I was in Sebastian Lopez on YouTube quoted it. And it was about this very thing. I spent the last like five minutes frantically trying to find it and I couldn't. And that was the thing that that this Lent was the very first Lent I've actually felt exactly what father's talking about Mm -hmm. is doing things out of love, like dying out of love. Like before it was rules, you know, like my first couple of years, it was rules. These are the rules. If I want to, appear to be orthodox these are the things i do then after that it was well yeah i mean lent is good because it kind of cleanses us spiritually now it's like okay if i'm gonna love god truly if i if i want to get to a place where i'm loving god as i am called to love god and not just like you know i love the lord i love the lord you know and like actually being able to like look at that gravity well and be willing to be like sucked into it and be willing to like actually like feel myself fall apart, then it has to come from a place of love. It has to come from a place of like, you're more important to me than catching up on whatever show. Like you're more important to me than watching Black Panther or whatever, you know, like it's more important and it has to be like, cause you are, and not because I'm, I'm, I think you are, have some vague notion that you are. It actually has to be like, no, you are more important to me than that. And that, you know, that's that death and all that stuff. And it's, cur- it's, it's, the, it's the connection between courage and love too, right? Is that courage is because, because what you're describing is something that takes great courage. You know, it takes mm-hmm. like, it takes great courage to, well, it takes great courage to go to cross, right? Like willingly, obviously, but mm-hmm. courage is, courage is all about love. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why the cowardly, don't enter it, don't inherit the kingdom, right? 
Yeah. That's revelation, right? The cowardly don't inherit the kingdom. The cowardly can't love. They can't love yeah. in the way that Christ calls us to love. You know what I mean? And the sorcerers, they don't inherit the kingdom. Why? Like, why are the cowardly and the sorcerers don't inherit it, right? It's like, and this is the thing about like the cosmonaut, which, you know, like, I mean, the psychonaut, right? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, because, you know, psychonaut, I get it. But like, you need to get to this place where you, where you say thank you, right? Listen, if you can, a soul that can be thankful is a soul that can be saved, right? That's, mm. that's Phil Alexander Schmemann. That's like probably his best quote, whatever. But like, it's true. And so being able to be thankful that you were able to have an, enough experience um, to bring you outside of yourself and to say, there's something beyond me. I want to, I want to discover what that is. That thankfulness needs to be tempered and it needs to be real. What I mean by that is, you know, um, once you begin to seek Christ, once you are, once you, by his grace, you've been pointed to him because no man comes to the father, but through him, right? And the father is all. So once you've had that experience and like, okay, you know, psychonauts and you're like searching orthodoxy, I just want to encourage you. There's going to come a time you got to put it down mm -hmm. because there it, it, it's kind of like the guy who wants to watch adult videos and his wife is right there. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Like, that's, that's why, that's why you put that down because it's like the real thing, real love is in front of you. Mm -hmm. And the, and the psychonaut stuff is just like a cheap imitation until it's not, you know what I mean? Um, well, excuse me. It's not. It's not a cheap in, imitation until it is. That's pretty, I just got backwards, right? So that that's the thing, and it's the same reason why the adulterers don't make it in because, you know, the wife of your youth, who you're supposed to rejoice in, she is the chosen vessel by which God is revealing love to you. And when you move outside of that, it's just another snapshot of God's providence, right? Mm -hmm. God's providence. It, whatever suffering has come through his hand to you, whatever joy has come through his hand to you, that is what is for you, right? And this gets us into this whole thing. That's why this, you know, everyone turning into a Ryan Mulvey guy, whatever the guy's name is, like, I'm going to make myself into whatever I want and I'm going to live in such a way that attention, like, I want to be the idol. I want attention. I want to be God. Like, it's so terrible because... It, it will never satisfy. And all of these things that are in the listing of those who do not inherit the kingdom, those idols, they all pull you away from like that, like the source, you know what I mean? And so we, we need to really, and that's what Lent does, right? Lent brings us back to center, at least it's supposed to. And to, and to show us like what is love, you know what I mean, and who is love, and 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 how do we get there? Um, do, do you know the the concept of homeostasis, Father? Uh huh. Yeah. So like, uh, um, there's a at a biology class um, I took in college. He said we we're born. You know, ninety eight point six is the temperature, and not, and homeostasis is the state in which your body is like working at its best. It's like that's what the how the body is meant to uh perfect balance perfect balance essentially and he's like now we come out with that and we pretty much spend the rest of our lives trying to get back to that mm -hmm. and i was just like and everybody in the laugh everybody in the class laughed kind of like sardonically like and it was at a community college so we had a bunch of like non-traditional students who'd probably seen a thing or two you know we're talking like 25 30 40 year old stuff like that so they kind of got this grander concept that was kind of being spoken about in this way of being like everybody's trying to find a way to return to center. Like everyone's trying to get back. And a lot of times that manifests itself as I just need to relax. I just need to focus on me. And I was just talking with my wife about this the other day, because she was talking about how vainglory has been working in her life. Mm -hmm. A father uh, signed her a very specific book. And then part of that book was talking about vainglory. Um, fathers asked her to read this book. And part of that was about vainglory. And I kind of like sat back. I was like eating. I kind of sat back and I was like, who knew that the cure for the thing that everybody is looking for is like looking, going through and naming all the things that are like wrong with you. 
Mm-hmm. Like just like pointing at them and naming them. Be like, I see how this is working. I see how this has corrupted this part of me. Mm-hmm. I see how this is working this thing through me. I see how I do this bad thing. And I don't even, and I'm so off base. I don't even know this is bad until someone points it out to me and has to walk me through why this is bad. Well, what's and crazy then, is, and again, you know, whatever, but just real quick, I mean, like, maybe we end on this point, I don't know, but like, that's the thing about the St. Ephraim prayer because it it it's, it is like the prayer for a reason. You know what I mean? Um, I well, think not, we should not, still not do the it. prayer because the prayer is the Jesus prayer, obviously. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like it, the way it lays everything out, both in what we ask God to take away from us and what what we ask God to give to us, yeah. it is like the most succinct formula of of spiritual medicine. I think you can. I mean, obviously, the reason why there's a reason why the church prescribes it to us, you know. Um, but you that that's a snapshot of exactly what you're talking about, Andrew. You know, what yeah. I mean? it's it's it, and I think. Because I think that should be a preview for next episode. Because I yeah. think that should be the next episode. Is Father? Deserves a, it deserves an episode. It deserves a two-hour episode yeah. in which Andrew just listens and doesn't try and talk about Star Wars or comic books or anything, and we just actually like sit and listen. And but um, that that's like uh, there's something about listening to chant. I that about like being in a service with the icons and the incense. It's like this like. It's like a code. I don't know. And I'm not sure I'm not. It's like a code is being up if you're letting it being uploaded into you. And it's like it brings you to this place. It's like of repentance because it's either you enter a state of repentance. Well, it is because it's inspired. Because remember, how does Lent start? Lent starts off with the expulsion from paradise. That's what that's that's what it is. Right. It's expulsion from paradise. And so chant is a revelation yeah and and right? so you know what i mean and so it's, it's the calling back we're being called back to paradise we're being called back to that 100 percent. and i love it because like the music and the incense of the two parts of orthodoxy immediately it's like those are the two pillars i can like i know are good like those are things that calls andrew back pretty quickly if i feel if i have a weird feeling if like i'm at at work and i need to come back light some incense <laughs> uh I listen to chant but it's almost like it's like a matrix thing where it's like it's like being jacked into the back of your brain a little bit because it's like you either enter a state of repentance of being like okay I'm here this is difficult this is hard but I'm going to be here or you have to like check out you can't like just sit there and not be affected by it because it's either like the code is uploaded into you or it's hitting you and just like flowing off you know what i mean like that's it, it, or, or you're or you're fighting it or you're that's fighting th- it that's the third option there there you go that it's absolutely the third option like you're like actively like saying no i don't i don't want this mm-hmm. but like that's the which mi- is brutal by the way as a spiritual but, principle i that's mean not a state you want to be in i've been there i've definitely been like no i'm not trying to feel this way right now because if i were to feel this way the good feelings i've had all day would be gone whatever blah blah, blah. and that and that is exactly what I and that is exactly what I was <laughs> when I when I completely lost my train of thought. Short and that, circuit. And that and that was the reason why it was the short circuit. Because I realized that like there come these it's it's kind of like it's rock bottom without hitting rock bottom. It's to where you're like, oh, I'm about to like everything's gonna change. I'm gonna make a move here and everything's gonna change. And it's like to fight that, to mm-hmm. fight it, to fight it. And that's the courage. Mm-hmm. And it's also like, I can easily see why I could, I, and and this Lent, I could easily see why somebody would be like, not going to do it. Lent, not going to do it. Yeah. People, not, it not gonna, to- I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to, I'm not going to yeah. go extra on the prayers. I'm not going to do it because I can't, whatever's, yeah. what's going to come, I can't deal with it. Yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, that's why people leave the church. Mm. And people leave the church. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and it's, I mean, I see, I personally see it on the micro every day. It's like, I'm going to come across somebody who's in a temptation. And it's like, I was, I was contemplating this today because that, look, oh man, I'm just, 
it's one of those moments I'm, I'm giving people a peek behind the curtain, but like <laughs> a lot of people, I've, man, there's just a lot of thoughts. So I would, during uh, the paraclysis tonight, we do paraclysis on Monday and I was like, oh, it's a good crowd tonight, whatever. And then I had that thought and then I was thinking, why are these people here? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, I was like, why are these? You know, it's just this weird moment where it's like, why, why are these? What are we doing here? Why are people here? And then it's like, oh yeah, most of the world would think this is so ridiculous. And it got me thinking. I was like, man, these people in my parish, they are coming here on a Monday night at six. Yeah, to pray. Wherever, whereas there's people, a lot of them, quote unquote Christians, they wouldn't even like, well, like, why are you doing this? You know what I mean? They won't go to, uh, they won't go to church Sunday church if it. They won't go to Sunday out. church, let alone a, a, a paraclysis or a vesper service. You know what I mean, there's people who, who, they'll go their whole life like, what's vespers, right? So, anyways, that's a whole other conversation. But the thing I'm trying to get is like these moments of like, what do, okay, you know, this is this is a real thing now. That being said, it's like there's this whole other world, you people out there, where you stop talking about, um, or at least as much, about, you know, the split between the West and the East, 1054. You stop talking about, you know, how Protestants don't get it. You stop talking about even just like liberals and wokes and conservatives and neo not Like you, you, you get this point where you talk about it every once in a while. And you hit this point where you start talking about temptations mm, mm -hmm. and temptations and the phenomena of temptations, getting us back to spiritual warfare, where this dominates your life. And that's, you know, don't try to fake it. Don't try to like artificially start talking that way. Cause you heard me say it. Cause it, it was it's not going to work, but you need to get to this place where it's like, it's really happening because that moment that your life is revolving around, like, the battle that spiritual warfare like the temptations and you feel this is this is where picking up your cross daily takes on a whole nother level it isn't just some kind of philosophical kind of symbolical like phrase that we use like it's not how jordan peterson describes it you know yeah. what i mean it's 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 very different and that is where people start bouncing that's where people bouncing meaning like I'm out. I'm not doing this because you get that taste of it. Isn't the dude kicking down the door with a machine gun saying, come here, Christian. That's almost easy. Yeah. It's, it's this level. Seriously. Yeah. It's that it's this level of the temptations where it's just like, what's going to happen here? You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you see yourself so honestly, so, and, and, the, and the devils, that's what they're doing. They're tempting you to jump off the 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 edge of the temple. They're 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 tempting you to to bow down and you know receive bow down before him and receive the, the kingdoms of the world. They're tempting you to try to make that stone bread and see if you're gonna see what's gonna happen. Like it gets real like that. And on my end, seeing people just literally just lose their minds they're not running down the street screaming but they are thinking and doing things that they would not think and do two days earlier why because they're in temptations and they are in a real battle if you don't know what i'm talking about you need to kind of like hang in there and get to that place because that is a scary thing because you start seeing that the spiritual warfare is a real thing, that the passion's a real thing. But the the really great thing about it is since we see that that's real, it means that a reward is also real. Yeah, It means that what he has for us, you know, as St. Paul says, the, the, the rewards of the next life don't even compare to the temptations of this life don't even compare to what God has in store for those who, who love him. You know what I mean? But you you don't understand that until you're getting into this realm of seeing the temptations. And again, forgive me, I'm not trying to force it, but 
that's what Lent is all about in a lot of ways too, is getting us to, it's giving you that micro dose. If you're willing to forgive the, you know, yeah, pun intended, it <laughs> it's giving you yeah. that micro dose of what that is, you know? Uh, we said it last week, but I'm going to say it again. Elder Ephraim of Arizona said uh, in his book on sickness and suffering that if we, they're going to, when there are people, there, there's going to be people in heaven, including you that wish you had suffered more. Oh yeah. Because you'll see the glories that await you. Oh, yeah. and the suffering that you've endured and you'll be oh man is like if you're you know, like in, in my case like you know my brother and my dad died or whatever it's like no take the rest of my family like take them like because they keep me here like and i don't want to be here like you know take i mean i don't know if i'm actually ready for that but like you know take 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 everything take everything and let me just live a wretched existence for the next 40 30 40 years you know um in faith in faith in faith. In faith. That's the for, that's the key. For in God's faith. glory. Yeah. yeah. In faith. Um, okay. I think we're gonna wrap there. Um, but I had a question for you, Father. Um I had heard, and I don't know if this is a, a real thing or not, but I figured I'd ask you on the show. Um, but do we read Psalms on Sunday? Like, um, do we pray the Psalms on Sunday? And someone had asked that to me. I was like, I could kind of see why we wouldn't, um, maybe outside of Lent, but I don't know. I've never heard that before. Well, technically, so the thing is, is, you know, there's the Psalms and Saturday, if you're like, if you're doing a vigil, mm -hmm. and that's technically Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. And so, so if if someone were to be doing psalms as part of their prayer rule, they should continue it on Sunday. That's fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. I don't think everyone's gonna get upset. Yeah. yeah. I bought. You know, because sometimes little things like that turn out to be a really big deal, and I'm like, oh wait, because you you're viewing something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh well, no. Every Sunday is a little mini Pascha, you know, and we don't read Psalms after mm -hmm. Pascha for like you know a week or something like that right. so but again that person they're, they're doing their rule at night there it is there so it's technically monday it's monday yeah okay all right um and then someone in the comments um we don't have to get too into this but someone in the comments asked this question and i thought we should address it uh why would those who have given themselves to darkness be concerned with karmic discharge we we're talking about the Woody Harrelson thing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, um, karmic have their beliefs deluded them into thinking that they can circumvent God's judgment with some technicality when God knows their heart and intention? What's the point? Yeah. Yeah, I think I responded to that. Did wonder... you respond to it? Okay. Well, then, what's it say I... there? I think I, because basically. I screenshotted the picture. Yeah. I, sure if I I'm not it. mistaken, I responded to that. But, but what I was saying is like, well, yeah, I mean, these people, first of all, um they believe that lucifer is the light bringer that he that he's going to win that he is god actually that he's the one who um who's going to end up winning in that he's um, the good god he's, he's the, the good, good god. god yeah and and that adonai is um backwards and capricious and cruel and basically allah you know so um and i and i am pretty sure because i i put in like see albert pike you know basically like um yeah i'm looking these, for the response right now um yeah so these oh, I, I can't i'm not signed into youtube but yeah. so i can't do so that. these these people that that's where that comes from and it's it seems absurd to us but i'm gonna tell you something just just to give people a little bit of um clarity on some things um like christian it's hard enough for you sometimes to keep the fast it's hard enough for you to you know do the things that you know you should do right christian um imagine now like the lure of real power or real fame or real um power not just in regards of influence but phenomena because that, that's a whole other thing that people don't want to talk about like there's a whole other thing about the phenomena that because I will just say to you, uh, if you hang in there long enough and sincerely enough, God God's gifts are not cheap, but you He does have gifts, 
Um, and when you experience them, truly, you don't, you'll, you'll give anything for them. Um, and the devil has his offerings too. Um, they're much cheaper though. They're much cheaper, not just in what they cost, but also the quality. Right. But, sure. but they are there. And I think, I think that's one of the things that gets lost. And I think that, you know, it's great because we're one, we're one of a handful of people who will talk openly about the the demonic phenomena, you know, like DPH on Kotel, like he'll, he'll open up about it and stuff like that. But there's a lot of people who, when they talk about the principles and the powers, they, they'll go like, yeah, demons getting back to like, you know, like even some of these people that are coming around like name and wolf, they'll get like, Oh yeah, demons. But they kind of stop short. And I, I think it's because, um, some of the quote unquote more, more fantastical aspects of what that encounter looks like. They've never experienced it, but let me tell all of you, I be very, I trust that those there is phenomena that you can experience when you practice dark things, which are incredibly powerful. Well, that's incredibly what I was going to powerful. So I don't, I don't look at those people per se, and I'm not accusing this person at all of anything like that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But we should be very careful because um, lest we fall ourselves, it is not some light thing. Like when when demons approach you on that level that people are being approached, what what you see, what you experience, is not something that you can that you easily like. Oh, pff, I'm not going to fall for that because listen, um, there are secrets that they know, and there is knowledge that they do have, and it's a it's a it's few and far between the people that have tasted some of that knowledge and experience and is and are able to say no to it right it's it's only really from my experience definitely literally my experience the grace of god that helps you to actually wake up and say no to it um so i i don't get you know now i i love the lord and and i get my umbrage because like you know I have an enemy who I loathe very much, but I don't lose, you know, I don't lose sight of the reality that when you taste that it's, it's beyond intoxicating, you know? So yeah, it's. That's what I was going to say earlier about the people I work with that recognize that the sugary sweet God that's bringing them cotton candy, there's something inherently wrong with that portrayal of God. Mm -hmm. It's because a lot of these people have messed around with the occult. So they know spiritual power, you know, like they at least have had a taste of something and this guy and they have some maybe even some understandings of the spiritual realm to a degree. Well, that's why a lot of these people, they're not evangelicalism. They will. They they can't go for it. That's what I'm I, saying. That That's why they're like, there's a lot of these people. They're like, yeah, I didn't I wouldn't I couldn't even give Christ a thought until I came across orthodoxy. I'm one of them. And yeah. what it because is, it's not it, real. Evangelicalism not real. is not offering it's anything not. real, and you know it immediately. You know it immediately. If you've had the experiences, you know immediately there's nothing there. That is and, that is just a joke. And the thing is about orthodoxy, even if you haven't been in a liturgy proper, you can feel the, oh, yeah. the power radiating out of it. Yeah, there's you no question. You can feel the truth of it. And that's that's a thing like, listen, there's a debate. You know, I'll just, I'll tell you like it is. We I brought it up this last week, I think, the last our last episode, but now, there's some people who are deluded who think that, like, you know, um, the Internet haven't, hasn't had anything to do with, like, the explosion of orthodoxy. It absolutely has in the sense that God is using it to kind of bring the exposure. But this is what this is what I want to bring up. People are feeling they feel the power even through oh, yeah. the Internet. Yeah. Why? Because it's the truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Truth. Christ is the truth truth is a person the power of christ radiates even through it do you you, you see what i'm mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. and i think that's the thing that people are not really understanding is that um now people can mistake that and the devil you know screw tape letters the devil's like mm -hmm. okay with people coming and approaching that because um even then they can become deluded and like look for that power for the, the you know lust of power right mm -hmm. 
that in of itself is, right is, is something that can delude you, but make no mistake. There's power and there's, cause the truth is, is radiating out of, out of orthodoxy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, that's all true. It's all true. And like father, you've talked about before, and we can truly end on this because I have to, I have to get going, but so in, in your tattoo shop back in LA, you'd have these icons, you'd have icons up and like pagans, witches, atheists would come in for work. And you'd be working on them or whatever. And they'd cuss, they'd be talking and they'd cuss and they'd look at the icons. Oh, sorry. You know, yeah. like, and you're like I, I didn't say anything like that's yeah. fine, whatever. And then they do it again. And they look at the icons. They say, like people are responding to that holiness, like on some level, <clears throat> It's speaking to them because it's the truth. So, okay. Well, gentlemen, um, we have a, a merch store. It's um, royalpath.store. Um, we get we don't get any of the proceeds. Go to the church, and then some of it goes to the people who make, the person who makes the, pro, uh, the merch or whatever. Uh, anytime we mention a musical artist or whatever, and I'll have to get some more on there. It hasn't been updated in like a month and a half, whatever. Um, it's on Spotify. It's the Royal Podcast playlist, something like that on Spotify. <clears throat> anytime we mention an artist, whatever we try and throw it on there. Um, uh, it feels like there's something else. Oh, if you want to reach us, please reach out to Andrew at royalpath.network. Um, that is a surefire way. If you need father's contact information or something like that, please reach out to me. Um, and I think that is it. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much for having a good night. Bye-bye.